Hello, I'm Craig and welcome to another episode of Football Kit Memories. Today I meet BBC Radio 5 Live's Dot and Adebayo. In our chat, Dot covers his arrival in the UK in the 60s, spends the late 70s balancing studying and starring in the punk scene in Sweden, and we talk about handling live callers on the brilliant World Football Phone-In show that he hosts with Tim Vickery on the BBC. Later I asked Dotton to pick out three of his favourite football shirts and tell me a little bit about what they mean to him. We talk about the popular Super Eagles shirt from the World Cup in Russia, a controversial Cameroon basketball style jersey in 2002, and we revisit the 60s for a discussion on Man United. You can listen to this and other episodes of Football Kit Memories on all major audio platforms including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Please do subscribe, share and above all, enjoy the podcast. Okay, so today on the podcast, I'm delighted to say I'm joined by BBC Radio 5 Live's Mr. Dotton Adebayo. How are you doing, Dotton? I'm doing very well. How are you? I'm good, thank you. It's uh, it's really great to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Um, So look, I've gone away and done my research, um, and you've had such a rich and colourful life. I just thought I'd kind of uh, go back to the start and ask you, you were born in uh, Nigeria. You came to London at six years old with your family. What was that like? Gosh, uh, funny enough, I'm just writing about it for another project. But um, oh. it was, uh, you know, you have to cast your minds back. You know, for me, it's over 50 years now since I, uh, since I arrived here. But I remember it very vividly. Um, I, I don't remember, you know, things like my father said to me, he was waiting at Heathrow Airport and it was a, a really foggy day. So the, the plane in those days couldn't land at the airport and it was diverted to Manchester and he was going crazy, oh, wow. you know, thinking, you know, what's happening and so on. But I didn't know any of that, you know, because the last I remember, I remember getting on the plane. I mean, obviously remember the home I left there, uh, living at my grandmother's house at the time. Um and this is where at my grandmother's house, my grandparents' house, I should say, was where most of their children um, dumped their children when they went overseas to explore, you know, studies and whatnot. Anyway, yeah. so we were all, all living in a very happy sort of extended family of lots and lots of cousins all around the place, you know. We've got photographs from that time when my grandparents were sort of astute enough to uh, gather around all their grandchildren to have a great big picture and everything so I've got a few of those and I had a lot of cousins living with me put it that way yeah anyway I remember getting onto a plane BOAC plane as it happens um, and being at the back the very back of the plane and a sort of a stewardess being very nice and looking after us as it were because we were traveling unaccompanied so right. I was six my older brother was seven at the time but yeah you know that, that's a that, that's a migrant story yeah it's um it's you've kind of uh you've moved around a lot as well so you you were based in London for a long time and then you went to university in Sweden right yeah I did uh, I was fortunate enough to go and manage to get a scholarship out there and have a great time as well you know I, I actually uh, connected with the place because I'd met some people over here from there uh, one summer, possibly summer of 77. Yeah, I think so. Okay. The, the, the punk hot summer of 77. Yeah. And uh, they'd say, you know, you know, you should come up there. And I was in my hitchhiking days in any case. I was traveling all over the place uh, without um, a real destination. Right. Uh, and uh, you know, I knew I had to get back to university because I'd been kicked out of university even by this time at the <laughs> tender age of 18. But um, I knew I had to get back because, you know, my, I come from a family of an academic. My father's an academic and right. very keen on that. But, um, yeah, I was just floundering around Europe mostly. Right. Not exclusively, but mostly Europe, um, trying to sort of... Uh, live the kind of hobo life for a while yeah inspired by Jack Kerouac's On the Road I must say. Right and how was kind of going to Sweden like we think of Sweden these days as a very kind of forward-thinking liberal country was it a kind of a stark difference to the UK back then in the 70s? First thing is it's extremely boring or it was in those days compared to London, you know London was where it was happening and there were people all over the place and you're running around doing this because it's uh, liberalism, social democratic liberalism, which 
ruled the country, certainly from the Second World War to uh, the late 70s, it would be. Right. Um, without a break, that comes at a price. And the price is, you know, a certain amount of, as we're real, realizing now with COVID, actually, uh, the price comes to a sort of a, um, a sort of a, you have to give up some things or adhere in some ways to a sort of a greater picture, a sort of a utilitarianism of um, um, behavior for the greater good. Right. And um, so, for example, in Sweden, you couldn't just make noise. You couldn't have a blues party in Sweden. <laughs> you know, you just, <laughs> in Stockholm at that time, you could not have a blues party. First of all, most people live in kind of apartments, apartment right. blocks, sort of mansion, old style, 19th century apartment blocks, uh, certainly in the center of town, although there is a mixture of slightly more modern uh, architecture as well. But uh, most people live like that. And believe me, you're not allowed to make noise. I had a gig at my house and a proper gig with like a PA system. Remember, I only lived like in a studio apartment, a tiny 25 square meter studio apartment. Wow. And maybe, in fact, I, I think it was only 20 meters squared in my memory. But anyway, um, quite a small apartment. And Dennis Bavel was the star of that, by the way. I'd gone to pick him up in Gothenburg and I was bringing him back. We were going to have a gig there to his surprise. I mean, when I got there, there were police vans everywhere. They around shut my it down. House. Wow. Yeah. Of course, of course, <laughs> of course. The idea that we were, I mean, there were so many people in my little studio apartment, I can't say, because a, <laughs> a friend had advertised it in one of the evening papers, you know. Uh, he had wow. mentioned it, sort of a journalist had mentioned it. So people were like, ram. We couldn't even get into our own apartment. I couldn't get into my own apartment. It was, it was uh, quite something that day. I remember it very well. So were you part of like the punk scene in Sweden then? I kind of was because I'd come from London. Yeah. And, um, you know, by, by then, I mean, here in London, I was of the opinion that the punks had stolen my style. And uh, <laughs> so when it all kicked off, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I did it first kind of thing. You know, me, right. and, my best friend, me and my best friend were going around believing that. <laughs> and uh, so went to all the gigs and everything, but slightly sneeringly. But we were, I would say, for that period, yeah, part of the London punk scene. So when I arrived in Sweden, um, I bumped into a punk, one punk, and you met one punk and it led to meeting all the others because yeah. they all used to gather around the same place right, in the centre of town. And so I got to know all of them in a very, very short time. And uh, to be truthful, they helped me tremendously unwittingly in my learning of Swedish I learned the language pretty fast you know in a couple of months right. so I must have met the punks initially you know maybe within a couple of weeks of uh, my being there in Stockholm and uh, yeah it just it just uh, from there I, I got to know how to bunk into nearly every major venue in Stockholm. I, I kid you not, we were bunking in all over the place. I knew how to bunk out. <laughs> I was an expert on bunking in all over the place and right. uh, and all the other things that we got up to. Yeah, but I immediately had a circle of friends. Um, you know, sometimes it ended up well, sometimes not so well, uh, and one or two times quite tragically, but um, I right. did end up having a circle of friends uh, that who still know me because yeah. I was the only black guy amongst them, you know, and so they've right. got a couple of Facebook groups and they showing photographs of us all, you know, that um, in, in those days taking photographs was quite a big, big deal, you know, so of course, yeah. be like about, they'd be like about literally like a dozen of us all cramming into a photo booth, you know, all sort of <laughs> paying sort of 10p each towards a communal photograph trying to squeeze into it all yes and loads of pictures like that and i'm the only black guy there yeah. in right. fact there's a photograph of a gig with ebba Grun, who were the the clash if you like um if not the pistols of sweden okay and 
um, they're at a gig at a youth club and it's packed out. I mean, the photograph is mostly the audience. I mean, there's one black guy because the light is on and there's one black guy. Then I looked a bit closer. Of course it's got to be me. You know? <laughs> so, even though you're looking at photographs of yourself when you were like 19 or 20 or something like that. But, yeah. yeah, yeah. Did, did you really release any music then? I did. Um, <clears throat> first with, uh, group, with several groups, actually. Um, but uh, all around the same sort of theme. Uh, well, not theme, but all around the same record company, which I had. I had a little record company out there, amongst other things. Oh, right. But um, I d was mostly in a couple of reggae groups. Um, it was the same reggae group, but changed its name halfway through from Zion Steppers to Giant Steppers. Okay. And got an album deal out of ABBA, out of it for it, uh, for oh. our one album on that thing. But uh, like all these... Uh, things you know um, you know we eventually just broke up uh, partly because I moved back to London so it would have been later on whilst I was there did a uh, few things with a group called Scan Stool before that and um, uh, went on tour with a couple of well-known Swedish groups around that time yeah I did a lot of music out there I did a lot of music music was what motivated me and I was a music journalist as well at the time so okay. I got a gig on a newly formed music paper out there and I was away so how do you go from being in a punk or a reggae band or an a reggae band and moving to uh, presenting football on radio? Well, I present news on radio. That's what uh -huh. I do. Uh, remember, but the sort of uniqueness of BBC Radio 5 Live, certainly when I started, was that it was news and sport. So <clears throat> in that amalgamation, Tim Vickery, who you've already spoken to, emerged... Yeah. Um, doing a 10 minute slot on a Monday morning, as I recall. And I remember hearing it even before I got into Up All Night, even before I ever really got into Five Live and thinking, wow, you know, this is amazing. I thought I had sort of stumbled upon some kind of secret nighttime club that, you know, <laughs> they don't, you know, the, nobody allows, you know, I'm, 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 I'm not being racist in this way, this is a joke, but you know, like, uh, don't let the black guy in, just don't let the black guy <laughs> in. It's, but but not in that way, they weren't saying it in that way, but I'm just saying, you know, if you know that kind of analogy, right. it, is, um, it was kind of like, how comes I don't know about this? You know. <laughs> Why do I not know about this? Anyway, so I got the um, I got the bug, and when I got the opportunity to go on Five Live, I said I wanted to present um, Up All Night, which was a program that Tim Vickery's Ten Minute Slot was in. And then uh, in that time, I um, was really looking forward to you know doing something with Tim. In any case, managed to get it expanded from ten minutes to about thirty minutes, then sixty minutes. And I turned around to the boss and I said, well, you know, a game of football is 90 minutes. So it got <laughs> and it's 90 minutes. In those days, I was a little bit cheeky like that. And sometimes we have our specials. Every now and then I convince them to let them do it for the whole four hours. But I'm essentially employed by the news section of the BBC. Right. So I'm not, I'm not a sport. Five Lives literally split between sport and what you call news. And news might take in other you know, um, interviews and entertainment aspects as well, but it's news. Right. So we were just talking off air. Like, I, I feel bad because I, I just woken you up from your kind of nighttime siesta before you oh, go don't back. Worry about that. Back to yeah. work. <laughs> um, but like, I was asking you kind of like how that works with kind of like managing late nights. And, and you were saying you're kind of very kind of uh, very structured with your sleep kind of thing. Um, I think like, the, the show is like really, really popular it's really worth it, I think, because people must love it. So it must be worth that hard work for you and, you know, getting that lack of sleep and stuff. It must be worth it to get that feedback, I guess. A hundred percent. It's worth it for you when you do a great interview. You know, you'll sit at home and think, yeah, I really did a good job on this one. You know, uh, you know the we all want to, um, and we are all artists in a way, but we all want to show the best side of us, show what we can do. You know, that's why... Yeah kids try to win the race, school uh, race, uh, parents day or whatever it is. Um, you know, they, they, they try and win their school race over 50 meters. They, they want to show how well they can do. Even yeah. those that lose try and show how well they can do. And um, that's part of the nature of our job. And particularly when you do it so regularly, it becomes easy. It's easy to take a program for granted and think, you know, once you've done that, it's redundant. But I go away thinking, how can I make it better? And sort of yeah. thinking about 
um, what I did right and what I did wrong and what we could have added to it um, and taken away from it and so on. You know, there, there is a process of critique as well as obviously the audience have got access to criticizing you as yeah. well through text messages and emails. They'll tell you what they think. Believe yeah. me, believe. <laughs> well, it must, you know what, it, it must be a very, very tough job for you to kind of, because you hold it all together and you're so reliant on the people that are phoning in to interact with you and kind of, it's often up to you to kind of bring the conversation along and uh, all these kind of disparate people all around the world that kind of call in and stuff. It's uh, it must be quite a stressful thing. Uh, it, it, it is stressful. Uh, there, there's a certain amount of stress in most jobs. It, it is stressful. Um, I'm on air for four hours mm-hmm. um, in the middle of the night. Um, as much as I ha- have no problem in working for four hours in the middle of the night, my body clock is like most people's body clock and it says, you know, this ain't right, you know? <laughs> and so that adds a little bit of stress to it, but you know, that's the nature of the game where you try and compensate for that in other ways, but also um, the, it's easy to put a foot wrong. So there's a certain amount of stress there. It's also easy for the program to fall flat on its face because it's yeah. essentially a phone in and a phone in is such a tricky, you know, it's going back to sort of, Alfred Hitchcock saying, you know, never work with children or animals. Well, you know, I, I could say if you want to put your head on the block, work with live callers and see how easy it is. See how easy it is. That was part, all part of the fun. I'm not in any way complaining about that. But, you know, when you work with live callers, it's kind of like anything can happen. So you're ready for that. To be fair, as you, you said, I hold it all together. I would say myself and Tim hold it all together because by now he's got my back and he knows when, right. you know, I need him to come in without me saying that. And um, <clears throat> it's a lot less stress when you've got um, the regular guest having your back in that way. Yeah. Well, you guys are a really great team and you do the Brazilian shirt name podcasts now as well. So you've kind of taken a lot of elements of it and you've removed the stress, I guess, of having these random people coming in. Um, (laughs) What I wanted to ask you about that one is, uh, so so the podcast for anybody that doesn't listen to it already, and they really should, is that you guys kind of focus on a particular game and you talk about that game, but then also talk about the wider cultural things that happen around it. What yes. I wanted to ask was, how much prep do you guys put into that? Because there's so much knowledge that gets exchanged, I think. Oh, there's a lot of prep in terms of most of the matches, even if we've seen them, we won't have a, a vivid recollection of them. So you try and watch it on YouTube if there's any clips from YouTube uh, or the whole match sometimes on YouTube, if you're lucky. And uh, then we all go through the newspapers at the time. I go through all the news pages of the newspapers and uh, Tim and I go through all the sort of sports pages. So the pages that are written about the match are the most important ones. So you're looking back on newspapers from whichever area you're talking about. And uh, then we go through the charts, you know, going through the charts of the time, just significant part of it, just to give us sort of a soundtrack to those matches to say, look, this is what people are listening to at the time. Yeah. And making that link between music and football, which has always been there, but it's been more out in the open maybe in the last uh, 20 years or so. Uh, and going through those charts and trying to sort of find a way to link what's in the charts with the football as well. It takes a little bit of uh, intellectual thought, I think. Um, so, yeah, and, and somebody has to collate all of that as well on top of that. Um, so th- there is a bit of work, you know. Yeah. Um, a- again, you know, if you have time and you have the manpower, um, which equates to money, but nevertheless, if you have time and the manpower, you can make something better. Yeah, you know, and the, the quality comes in the amount of time and manpower and obviously the right manpower but even if you had the right manpower but not enough of it you would still struggle to make it quality yeah I, I mean hard work pays off doesn't it and you know I think oh, 100%. The, the listeners understand that um kind of sticking with music as well so you've recently launched a podcast with uh your wife it's the oh, making yeah. love songs podcast it's fun. It's fun. She loves it. She loves it. Um, it took me about 
probably about five years to get my wife to actually do this because I've been really? saying to her for ages, I've been saying to her for ages, you've got to do it, you've got to do it. <laughs> you know, you love to sing, you're the chick who loves to sing. Well, tell people about what, and you sing love songs. Well, tell people about them. What is it about? What makes this love song better than this? I've been begging her for yeah. five years. And um, eventually it clicked, you know, it gets like that sometimes in relationships. Maybe I wasn't coming at it from the right way or whatever it was. It right. didn't click with her. And eventually it clicked. And now I can't stop her, you know, going into the <laughs> studio. And she spends a lot of time, remember, she's rearranging songs to sing her version of it live. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and well, not live, but nevertheless, uh, but her version of it. And then we do do a bit of research on the songs, analysing it, and uh, the sort of uh, people who have covered the songs, for example, and the context of the songwriter and so on. But it, it is a freestyle between myself and Queen of Lovers Rock, who's my wife, Carol Thompson. Yeah. Um, it is a kind of a freestyle. She kind of knows what I'm like. So in a way, you don't have to construct it in the way that you would have to construct um, something like with me and Tim, for example, you know, you, you have to sort of sort of explain, right, the reason why we need to look at this chart or the reason, you know, blah, blah, blah. With my wife, we can just go off on a tangent and yeah. bring it back to the same place. Um, it's great. It's a, it's a, I enjoy, I, I, I do enjoy uh, talking about love songs. So it's a, a match made in heaven, I think. So Dotton, sh should we talk about some football shirts? That's the reason yeah. I want you to come on the Let's podcast. Do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. So the, the generic question I ask everybody is, what do football shirts, if anything, mean to you? Oh, I'll tell you what. It means something that goes beyond uh, club loyalty. I was on a train once with West Ham supporters. They played Liverpool in Cardiff because for some reason, it was during the time that Wembley maybe was being rebuilt or whatever yeah. it was. And... Um, West Ham versus Liverpool in Cardiff, FA Cup final. Liverpool won it 2-1, I think. Uh, Steven Gerrard obviously was in the yeah. centre of it all. And I'd gone up on the train with the West Ham fans and I thought, oh, gosh, you know, what should I wear? What should I wear? What should I wear? Because I didn't want to be on either side. I wanted to be yeah. neutral, you know. And But I knew that I had to wear a football shirt. It was a hot day as well, to be fair. But I knew how to wear a football shirt so that people knew that I wasn't some flipping tourist waiting patiently to get mugged or something like that. <laughs> so, um, I, I, I made the mistake. I don't know what got in my head. I made the mistake of thinking the England shirt was a neutral shirt, you know? Right, right. And um, the only thing is I chose the red top England shirt. Ah, Okay. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why I thought that I could get away with that. For some reason, I just thought the England shirt means something. For me, I saw it as an England shirt. Yeah, yeah. Other people, you know, from a distance, and it is slightly more orange than, um, than the Liverpool shirt, maybe. But from a distance, other people saw it as everybody just thought I was a Liverpool fan. Right. I couldn't take it off because I had nothing else. You know, <laughs> I, cover it. I, I literally went to Cardiff on a hot day with just a football shirt. But the point I was going to make was that was what even though West Ham fans looked at me a little bit funny on the train as well but once they knew all oh, right it's all right he's a new trial oh that's an English shit once they knew that then it was peace and love but it felt like I was part of them I felt part of a, a tribe. greater yeah yeah a, a tribe is a good way of putting it but a greater tribe than just the tribe of my club so yeah. a football shirt means you're you're part of the gang, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So your first choice, um, it's an exciting one. It's the Nigeria World Cup 2018 shirt by Nike. How come you chose it? Well? well, because everybody else chose it for the World <laughs> Cup. 
it sold everybody out, else it? yeah it sold out if not several times yeah. i cannot believe with all those entrepreneurs in lagos and elsewhere in nigeria that they couldn't mass produce them and get them hooky or otherwise because <laughs> they sold. the whole world would have been wearing that football shirt yeah there, there is something and i don't know if that football shirt well you have to always hope with fashion that they'll develop things but i don't know if that football shirt can ever be beaten in terms of um, the um, immediate aesthetic appreciation yeah. of a football shirt. People just loved it. I couldn't get one. Really? And he, you know how much it pissed me off to see white guys wearing them? Right, okay. <laughs> At the gym. It was like, it's white guy. And I'm no, it's honestly, generally, it's not a race thing. You know me. It's not a race or racist thing at all. But I'm like, hang on, you've got one. I'm the Nigerian in this. You know, yeah. if I'd seen another black guy wearing one, I'd have probably thought, oh, he's a Nigerian. He's lucky to have got one. Right, but he's right. all white guys. And I'm like, if I can't get one, how can you get one? I was so... <laughs> pissed off you know i wanted to say to him actually you know that shirt it belongs to me you know i'm nigerian you know what i mean and um you've got an england one he can have yeah, well, yeah. Red one. <laughs> <laughs> he can say that to an fa cup final yeah. uh, between liverpool and west ham if he likes but no I, I just i just um it's beautiful there's something about the color co coordination the green white and black green and white is actually the na national colors of nigeria but they threw in the black there yeah green it's always been one of those colours for a football shirt that is special. I don't know if it's often because it's associated with sort of uh, Catholic clubs or whatever it might right, be. Right, right. Or, you know, Celt Celtic more. Yeah. More, uh, yeah, obviously, perhaps. Um, but when you see, because Sporting Lisboa in Portugal, you know, I, I wouldn't really know anything about Sporting Lisboa, but I know they've got green hoops and yeah. you know, that's like Celtic and that is a very special kind of uh, football kit. It stands out and uh, it gives the club a real sort of, uh, you know, aura, aura. I think that's yeah. it, an aura about it, that blue doesn't quite do, red doesn't quite do, and you know, solid colours don't quite do. White doesn't quite do either. Um, and yeah, so green stands out for me anyway, but the way that they zigzagged the green in that football shirt and in between the um, black and the green, there was the white. Uh, it was just, a, it's a beautiful shirt. It probably overshadowed our performance at that World Cup, you know? Yeah. Um, it was one of those things when people start concentrating on the football shirt and thinking, don't we look nice? It takes your mind off the football. I, I wonder if players aren't better being angry that they look so rough. Yeah, um, maybe so. Maybe so. You know, the, somebody sent them out in crocus bags, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think they had a tough group, didn't they? They had like Croatia and Argentina, I think, in the group. So, but you know, we are better than Argentina, but. Every, the results don't show that. Well, no, right. I would say that. <laughs> Each time cool. we played Argentina, we have been um, a match for them at the very least and at points ahead of them. Right. But all for, we always fall for the old flipping trick of, um, right, um, don't put all 11 men in front of the goal. Keep a couple of men out there, especially when Argentina get corners with Batistuta <laughs> on the field or something like that. We, it's an old trick. We fall for it every single... You watch how Nigeria has lost to uh, Argentina in the last couple of times that they've met in the World Cup. You'll see it's the same thing. Going back right. to 1994, I seem to remember that, when uh, I remember it very clearly, actually, because... Um, no, no, it was 94. It was, uh, yeah, it would have been about 94. It was a 94 World Cup, I'm pretty sure of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so I was in the States for the preamble, but when Nigeria met Argentina, I was back in London, staying at my younger brother's uh, uh, flat up near the Arsenal. And um, the local, keeping a low profile, by the way, right. if you live in Arsenal territory, uh, <laughs> and the local off-license guy was some Greek guy um, because Nigeria were ahead of Argentina. I can't remember what the scores were. And then right. Argentina 
got these two corners or whatever it was and uh, scored two goals in quick succession just when we were about to win. And uh, I went to, and I don't drink, I don't drink. Normally okay. I don't drink, you know, I can drink. I'm not saying, um, you know, an abstentionist or anything, but um, the, when I went across the road to drown my sorrows, I uh, just thought, oh, let me just get some flipping alcohol and drown my sorrows. Yeah. And I went across the road to the local offy and the owner of the offy was a Greek guy who said to me, you're Nigerian, aren't you? And I was I like, know. Yeah, no, I'm pretty sure maybe I'd had a conversation with him before, okay. but he just like remembered. And he goes, why don't your team just put 11 in front of the goal? Why didn't they do that? And I couldn't answer. It was the most route one obvious thing to do when you're sort of a goal up against Argentina in the World Cup and there's only a few minutes to go. Put 11 people in front of the goal. <laughs> No, we, we, we want to show our skills and stuff like that. Fond memory. So are you, are you a Nigeria fan then, over an England fan? Is Nigeria your team that you follow? Um, yeah, I follow Nigeria. I wouldn't say they're over England anymore, but they were once. Right. And uh, I'll tell you the story behind that in a moment. But yeah, I think when you have your roots somewhere, you're always slightly a fan of that country's team because yeah. you know it's you know where, where you um a, a, you have an affinity with it but um up until the world cup of what it had been 2002 would this have been when england played brazil yeah and um yeah england played and it was early morning i seem to remember they played yeah. about 11 o'clock 11 o'clock in the morning here i seem to remember shooting home and the roads were empty to to watch the match and uh my younger daughter would have been about three years old at this point and uh, she asked me daddy who who are you going to support because i think this is the beckham one and uh, Svenja and ericsson and all of that yeah Lots of young girls were into the World Cup because of David Beckham, probably. And anyway, she said to me, who are you going to support? And uh, I said, uh, Brazil, of course, <laughs> because I grew up in that generation of uh, young black men in London who were going to support anybody but England because okay. of, you know, that, that was our relationship with the country at the time. Anyway, things have moved on. My wife looked at me, he said, how can you say that? How can you say that? Look at all those players, you know, because they were like walking around, shaking each other's hands or whatever in the lineup. And she said, half of those players, look at them. I suddenly noticed for the first time that half of the England players were black. Right. She said, that's her generation. They're representing her generation. That's who she needs to look up to. Right. And it came as a real shock to me that I hadn't thought of that. And you can't let the baggage of, let's say, the way that you were treated in this country at a different, less informed, enlightened time um, be the burden of the next generation you can't yeah you that's can't. really and interesting you, yeah and you've got to realize where they are they are british you know my daughters have been to africa but it was only morocco so <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that's a really interesting point i think yeah it's a definite kind of the team is definitely a reflection of multiculturalism in the uk isn't it there's there's players that have played for england from all different sorts of backgrounds and things and mm. remain so so you're right in that respect very much so and you can so you can relate to that you know you can relate to that it's funny um so my musical expertise let's say or at least a lot of the time that i spent writing music was a lot of it was about reggae right and it was funny that every now and then you'd get a white reggae artist and what it did amongst other things was enable an audience that was somewhat skeptical or hesitant of reggae, to use a popular word. Right. And it just allowed them to engage with it a little bit more, whether it was UB40, you know, UB40, a lot of reggae bands, um, black British reggae bands look and think, you know, UB40 ruined it for them because UB40 became the sort of go-to reggae band. 
from the and, UK, right? Okay. Yeah. So, so the only thing that they were going to play on UK radio was Bob Marley and UB40. It was like that for a long time. Okay. So, Steel, Steel Pulse, who clearly are a better band in many ways, but were a little bit too militant for the charts, to be honest. But anyway, but that aside, the only person that ever played Steel Pulse was John Peel. Out of right. You know, apart from me, when I had a shot playing some reggae tunes once upon a time, but um, oh, and possibly David Ronigan, yeah, and a couple of other reggae DJs, but mainstream, uh, they wouldn't have played it. And um, the, the uh, you know, but I will say, nevertheless, they brought a lot of white kids into reggae. There were a lot of white kids in reggae already, by the way, you know, there was a kind of a, a, punk a hero, reggae right? scene. No, even before that, skinheads. Right. You know, even before that, straight back into the 1950s, uh, going back, there were a lot of young white kids in what was then you know, the early, early, uh, what you call blue beat songs as well. Okay. And um, Scarish, you know, but just slightly before Scar, maybe. And, uh, but, so th there's been a long tradition of that, but you can't argue that UB40, in fact, when you look at it trajectorily, UB40 could very well argue that if it wasn't for us mixing up and bringing a lot of white kids into reggae, uh, Two Tone would have struggled. Yep. Two Tone and Coventry up the road from Birmingham would have struggled. Birmingham yeah. being where UB40 came from, you know? Yeah. That's uh, interesting. We've, we've got onto a chat on music. Can I ask you, where do you stand on the Clash playing reggae? Oh, well, you, you know Joe Strummer put me on stage. Do you know this? I didn't know that, no. <laughs> I thought you did your research. I did. I didn't hear this story. Wow. Well, come on now. Did it's you uh, on stage? It's uh, Chris Salovich, great enemy features writer, wrote a book, a uh, biography of Joe Strummer. There's a full page which is uh, dedicated to uh, an account that I gave him of my um, uh, being put on stage by Joe Strummer. Okay, long story short, living in Sweden, went down to Gothenburg to see a friend. Uh, the Clash's uh, roadie at the time uh, knew me quite well from London, and he saw me outside and said, oh, come in, come in, come in, come in, come in. So yeah. I'm all there with him, get backstage passes and everything like that. And um, by the way, the, the roadie's name was Ray. And um, yeah, anyway, get... Uh, backstage passes a lot of kids clash were always letting the uh the kids the fans come backstage you know okay. and eat up all the food provided on the you know artist list of requirement by the uh, tour company and so on anyway i was backstage sitting next to joe's drummer a crowd of people around him and i said joe it's a shame that mikey dread isn't opening your shows at the moment mikey dread being the great reggae toaster that the clash used to use at the time okay. it wasn't on this tour and joe strummer said yeah, yeah yeah it's a shame and i said well i know the best reggae mc in stockholm and he said look if you can get him to the gig at the ice stadium in stockholm tomorrow he can play yeah and i was like well joe it's me and he said cool <laughs> and um he sorted out with cosmo vinyl and I, you know, right up until I got to the ice stadium, I did, I wasn't sure that you know that, oh, they must have forgotten and everything. But no, I was treated like a prince for a day. Went up and wow. did a few reggae numbers as a support band to the Clash. Yeah, yeah, that's the story. So I ain't gonna knock them. I see. Okay, okay. You like their stuff? Nice. So I do actually. I think Bank Robber, great bass line and everything like that. Um, the way that we all got into. Uh, reggae of the clash was through police and thieves on their yeah. seminal debut album and it was an amazing you know for years i didn't know which one i preferred now i would say julia mervyn <clears throat> julia yeah. mervyn has um still feels like it hasn't aged whereas the clashes one does you know like a lot of punk now yeah. it feels like it belongs in an era locked in and like with a lot of reggae great reggae it doesn't feel like that. It feels like they're very fresh. Yeah. Um, but for years, between the ages of probably 17 and probably 30, I probably had 500 arguments about which one was better. Yeah. So, Dalton, I better ask you about another football shirt. I don't want to take up too much of your time. So no, your second okay. shirt is a controversial shirt. 
Uh, I think it's the first shirt we've had on a podcast that's been banned, actually. So this is the Cameroon sleeveless shirt that I wore at the AFCON in 2002 by Puma. How come you chosen this one? Well, because of its controversy, amongst other things. Yeah. But I thought this was the ultimate football shirt. I thought this is the future because how intimidating was that? The reason it got banned is because these Cameroonian footballers were showing their pecs, mate. They were shredded, you know? weren't they? They looked crazy. I know, I know. It's mad. Yeah. Everybody else looked puny compared to them. Yeah. Everybody, I bet they looked like giants just because, you know, they, they had uh, muscles and yeah. they were showing their biceps and so on. But it was an amazing shirt. And I thought, yeah, if, if ever you want to intimidate the opposition, cut off your shirt sleeves. It Get is the guns a, out. Yeah, well, it is a snazzy looking top anyway. The Cameroonian colours just work together, you know, mm. the red, green and gold of it and the, the shades of red, green and gold that they have as well. And so it works in any case. But um, the, the way that the, the shirt took on a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, muscularity about it, I thought was the way of the future. I thought everybody was doing it. It was such... It was such a long way from the sort of baggy shirts of, yeah. the, again, David Beckham era that we all sort of recognise so much. The baggy shirts of Ryan Giggs and all yeah. these players. You always thought saw with their with their shirts flapping everywhere. It's funny we were mentioning police and thieves a moment ago. Do you know the the uh, the toast version of? And by that I mean the the rap version of yeah. police and thieves is by a guy called, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's by Jar Lion. Okay. He did uh, an album called Colombian Collie. You can imagine what that was about. <laughs> and uh, Jar, so if, if it was him, um, he does this version of Police and Thieves. So it's got Junior Irving singing Police and Thieves in the street. street and then yeah. he says, he starts rapping and he says, uh, um, with their, they're all running. The police and the civilians are all running with their shirt backs full of wind, full right. of wind. You know, because their shirt exactly they're flapping and it holds you back a bit. It's actually not the best, um, you know, dynamically aligned, streamlined kind yeah. of shirt. If you want the ultimate. Um, performance in terms of speed in any case so it didn't make sense this Cameroonian shirt was the diametric opposite to that they looked amazing and the opposition looked puny because they did get to wear it in at least a couple of matches didn't they before it was banned yeah I think they, they won the AFCON in it didn't they from what oh, I right okay and then, and then in the World Cup in that year 2002 I think FIFA made them sew black sleeves on Okay, I oh, was at it. Okay, yeah. I, I didn't really. I, I just remember them playing some matches with it. So by the time it got banned, you know, I probably didn't even know it got banned. I was probably thinking, why did they change their shirts? Yeah, you know, and they didn't do badly. You know, winning the Afcon and then going on to the World Cup. I'm sure they did quite well there. But it, it puts the fear of God into the opposition, seeing how muscular the other side is. Yeah, you don't want Samueletto coming at you in one of those, do you? Exactly. So, Dot, your, your final shirt is, uh, you've gone for the kind of classic Manchester United shirt, the late 60s and early 70s. We've got the George Best, kind of Dennis Law era. Is this the one with the crew neck or the one with the more flappy collar you've gone for? No, 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 crew neck. No, 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 no. Flappy collar, no, no, no. Uh, it's definitely the crew neck. Yeah. And it was, the, it was synonymous with football for my generation when I was like six years old. So we're talking about mid uh, to late 60s and the um w whatever team you supported the only well i suppose the generic football shirt for us all was this manchester united football shirt arsenal had a decent kit at that time tottenham well standard bog standard uh, West Ham had a decent kit at that yeah. time. So there were teams that had other decent kits at that time. But I think maybe because of, uh, maybe it was more like when I was eight years old when Manchester United won the European Cup. And then, but they had Georgie Best already. They had Georgie Best and Bobby Charles. Uh, Georgie Best in particular, iconic footballers in terms of 
who they were rather than their football. Yeah. You know, Georgie Best had the amazing name of being best, you know, yeah. and people believed he was best and he was a great dribbler. And it was kind of like amazing as a kid yeah. to watch him. Uh, yeah, before it got to that, uh, he, he did well with the flappy shirt version of, uh, sorry, flappy neck version of the football shirt as well, I must admit. Yeah. But I will say one thing. I will say one thing about that top. The one criticism of it I'll, I'll make. I mean, I, it's, I'm pretty sure it had the old sort of standard red devil uh, badge as well. Didn't I think it? they introduced it, yeah, yeah, towards the end of the 60s, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It had that on it. and uh, But it wasn't like a badge. I think it was just imprinted yeah. on it, if my memory serves me right. And um, the one thing I will say is that when they get to that, flappy neck generation they've started using black socks uh, because uh, my generation of things they're only wearing white socks as far as i remember i don't remember I them ever know. wearing a black socks okay. at that time i could be wrong here manchester united supporters will have to correct me if i'm wrong yeah but i remember the black socks as being a slightly later generation which doesn't quite work the white socks for manchester united just look a little bit wrong Right. Uh, the black socks, once you see them, again, like the Cameroonian shirt, gives it a little bit of an impact, you know. It means business, I think, you know. And, um, yeah, that's the only thing I would say. But otherwise, it was always... The Manchester United football shirt of that era was always... When you did PE, and there was always a sort of a, a stack of uh, uh, PE kits that had been abandoned from previous generations. Lost property. So, Exactly. So you couldn't get out of, sir, I left my kit at home. Well, yeah. here's somebody's nasty pair of shorts. <laughs> you got to wear that. <laughs> and they threw it at you. But there was always a Manchester United shirt in there as well. You know, it was, right. it was an iconic standard shirt for my generation. And when I think back to those days, that's the one shirt that sticks out very much for me. Nice. Well, Don, thanks so much. That's some really interesting choices there. It's a pleasure. Um, so, so people should look out for you on the Brazilian shirt name podcast, the World Football Phone In as well, and then also your new uh, Making Love Songs podcast as well. Yeah, and people should look out for you on your podcast as well. It works both ways. Oh, well, thank you very much, Dotson. Well, look, it's, it's been a real pleasure to speak to you, and thanks so much for your time, mate. No, and you too. So, there you have it. Massive thanks to Dotson for sharing his football kit memories with me. You can follow me and my own collection on Instagram or get in touch via Twitter or email. Make sure you follow Dotson too and check out some of his projects. All of those are listed in the notes section. The music was produced by Evil Ed. There's a link to his music in the notes section too. And other than that, I guess that's it. Until next time, I'll see you later.